We are considering on page 3 and section 1 the item 4 in parenthesis, you remember, and we were saying that the Bible establishes the fact beyond question that God is living in a duration of time. If we take the Bible for our source, there can't be any question about this. And we were considering some of the passages here, just a few of the many that are available on this subject. Remember we had said that there was a change in the relations of the Godhead. And we have the advent of the Lord Jesus in a distinct period of time when he said he came down. And this was a distinct change now the virgin birth or the incarnation. This was a change in the life of the second person of the Trinity. You see the importance of this now? Here's the eternal second person who is entering into a change which is going to be permanent. Isn't this remarkable? In this mysterious combination of the divine and the human, the second person of the Trinity is never going to be the same again. Isn't that a tremendous thing? And so through the virgin birth, he enters our humanity. Lives for a period of time, a distinct period of duration here. And then he returns to the eternal position. But in this return, he brings a resurrected human body with him. So heaven is changed since the incarnation. Now we believe that although we can't perceive the spiritual things directly now as we say it, this does not mean that spiritual beings are not distinct entities. They are. Not some vague, indefinite imagination. We can't perceive these spiritual things now, but they are distinct and definite. Can you perceive the immensity of the incarnation? And now Jesus is brought back into the very essence of God's throne, his presence, a resurrected human body. And we are to be like him. And we are to have resurrected bodies like his. And he is always going to be our elder brother in a special sense. Like he wanted to be here. And so here's a distinct change in the experiences of God. How can you imagine an eternal now existence and fit in a revelation like this, you see? It's just impossible. There's just so much profound evidence. When you sit down to assemble it, it's truly astonishing that there ever should be any questioning about this. But lo, it has, there has been in an utter confusion. Uh, one of the lovely passages from the heart of Jesus during the third year of his ministry, as we're going to have blessing over in a later section, appears in John 7, 39. And here the Lord is prophesying what's going to happen after the problems of salvation are settled. And he said that these wonderful things can't happen now. And he says, This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Here's something future. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Here's a, a great revolutionary change going to come in the operations of the Holy Spirit. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So here, in the duration of God, when the Lord Jesus would ascend back into the presence of the Father, then they together would send the Holy Spirit 
for his special wonderful ministry on earth. And what a wonderful ministry this is. The first thing he's doing is making it hard for anybody to be an unbeliever. Because remember, the word unbelief is a refusal to believe, not a weakness of belief. In other words, there's so much evidence in existence that you have to work hard if you don't want to believe. And this is because the Holy Spirit is operating in these tremendous ways. So this is the first thing he's doing, convincing the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment, persuading of what is true concerning God and man. So here was a tremendous change going to come. And here is a parenthesis in the history of the world, which is going to be called the church age, during which, as we saw yesterday, a most remarkable relationship is going to exist when the Holy Spirit would take up his abode within our personalities in a special sense like could not have existed in Old Testament times nor in the Gospel times. So here we have a distinct change. This is what Jesus said before he left. And we have in Acts 2.33 the fulfillment of this. Uh, Peter refers back to the same idea Jesus talked about and said, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he had shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So how can you conceive of such a thing as this taking place? if God is not living in a duration. Then we have that summary passage in Revelation 1.8 where most obviously God has a past, a present, and a future. This is what it says here. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Now maybe you've heard the idea that those who believe in the eternal now concept often say, although God basically is an eternal now, he makes choice to enter into a duration to accomplish this mission of Christ and this advent of the Holy Spirit and then makes choice to move out of a duration again into his eternal now concept. Now the fallacy of this whole thing can be destroyed in one sentence. If God is an eternal now, he doesn't have a duration to make a new choice in. How then can a being who doesn't have a duration to make a choice ever make a choice to do something differently because you've got to have a duration to make a choice in. You see how all these speculative ideas accumulate and create problems. But how could you ever have any realistic concept of these tremendous things? Then the, it is endeavored to brush aside all these hundreds of passages by the mere word anthropomorphism. Now anthropos means man, as we've said. And so the idea back of this expression is that although God basically is not like this, Yet he acts as though he is so that we would have some understanding of his being. Now there's one colossal trouble with this. God is a God of truth 
And if he, would ex if he intended us not to understand literally these countless records that he's made, he should explain this to us somewhere, don't you think? He should say, well, now this is what I'm saying, but this isn't really what's going on. So how absurd it gets to have this simple brush away of all the evidence. And so we come to this paragraph you have here on page 3. And nobody in the wide world can say a thing about this because this is simply a collection of what the Bible says God does. So we read, God is presented in the Bible as a living being who walks or dwells with men, performs definite acts at definite times, who rests, observes, thinks, and is reasoned with, remembers, is grieved, is jealous, is provoked to anger and then causes his wrath to rest, is moved with compassion, who forgives and comforts, delights and rejoices, hearkens unto men, repents, changes his purposes, makes new decisions, and so forth. Now this is simply an assembly of what the Scripture says God does. These various acts, states of mind, or experiences obviously conflict and cannot coexist at the same instant and thus require the chronological element of time for their occurrence. So we quote Isaiah 57, 15, God is the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose years are throughout all generations, and which shall have no end. And so we can come back to the elementary concept of our spiritual experience and have the exciting realization that God is living along with us in the same duration we're living in. And He hears our prayers when we pray. He thinks about our situation as they arise. He makes new decisions. He's moved with compassion. He's moved with love. He's moved with rejoicing. When we submit to Him and please Him, what a tremendous thing to realize. And this certainly must be the basis of fellowship, mustn't it? We want to go on and look at some of the characteristics of the Godhead that establish personality and so we see that the Godhead possesses intellectual activity or personal intelligence we just remind ourselves of a couple of passages here we have 1 Samuel 2 35 a prophecy concerning Jesus and I will raise me up a faithful priest, and he shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Notice here God refers to what is in his mind and what is in his purpose, and that Jesus is going to fulfill this perfectly. Then we have Isaiah's invitation. Expressing God's heart in Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though we red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come now, let us reason together. For God is a God of reason. Then in the 55, 55th chapter of Isaiah, verses 8 and 9, we have a reference to God's thought. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Notice God makes a similarity between our thoughts and His. And just as we have to have a process of time then in 
in the process of thinking, so obviously God under, means us to understand that he also has thoughts in this process of time. So we have this evidence of God's personality. Ability of intelligence is measured by the profoundness of the product of thought. This gives us some appreciation of the greatness of God's ability. And so as we concentrate upon the divine conduct and the unspeakable wonders of design, we're certainly overwhelmed in our minds with the evidence of God's intelligence. And we have no observations of any deficiency, anything that God has overlooked or lacked as far as his experience goes. But think of this revelation now. God is not only a God of intelligence, but a God of emotional experiences. My, how this is a moving thing to think about. You can see that these concepts remove completely from our mind the idea that God can experience emotion, have experiences. How can you have experiences if you don't have a duration? Isn't this a moving thing? I was never taught anything like this in my theological study. In this reading I referred to, I collected about a hundred passages throughout the Bible that indicates God's grief, his sorrow, his disappointment over sin. We're going to refer to some of them under consequences. Well, you notice we list as the first consequences of sin, grief, and disappointment to God. What a revelation! If this won't move us, what will? You see how theology has all, always seemed to tend in its philosophical development to things that move people away from being touched in their hearts and in their being. How can anybody be touched by the revelation of God if he can't have any experiences? If God is the great arbitrary sovereign, as theology has so often said, then where's the moving force to move us into humility? But when we begin to tell the people that God is not this great arbitrary philosophical being, but that he's a great being who has affection, who has love, who experiences joy and experiences disappointment. My, what a difference that makes. We have, for example, in Genesis 6, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, Verse 5, And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Oh, can you imagine how God feels here? We're going to see that God has access to our inner personalities and he's the only one that does. We don't know each other. All we know is communication with one another. But God has access directly into the center of our personality. We're certainly glad the devil doesn't have access into our center of our personality. Some uh, Bible teachers seem to intimate that he does. He's got to wait for our manifestations just like everybody else. And so God alone has access to our being. This tells me if I submit to my precious Savior, I can just rest myself. And he's going to give me that serene rest and confidence. And so God has access into our hearts and minds and beings. He sees what's in our imagination. And here the picture is, God looked down upon his creature men. What does he see? Does he see them using their great imaginations constructively as he created them to? 
Or what are they doing with their imaginations? Trying to figure out and imagine new designed ways to gratify themselves? How did God feel concerning this? We're going to see under the next heading here. We're looking at the grief part right now. It repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. Now the heart is a figurative expression. We don't actually have a heart in the spiritual life. I think it's a figure of expression from our bodily center of activity. And so just as our physical heart is the center of our body, so God is trying to say that there's a center of our personality deeper than which cannot be excavated. And so he says that just as the Heart is the center of our body, so there is a center of our personality. And we are created in the image and likeness of God, we're told. So God has a center of his personality too. And here's where his grief was experienced. Think of the significance of this. We'll have more to say about this. Oh, this just revolutionized my thinking in a way I just can't describe. It just melted my heart down in gratitude. It seemed to move a delicacy of concern for God that I hadn't had before. It wouldn't seem like we small moral beings could contribute to the happiness of God. Or it wouldn't seem like we could multiply the grief of God. But along comes the Bible and says this is so. Oh, how tender and delicate we ought to be in our relation to God. And just as grief is in proportion to knowledge, think then of God's grief you have uh, Psalm 95, uh, 10 and 11. We looked at this in connection also with duration. Just think of its revelation of grief here. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. And then can you imagine the revelation in Ezekiel 6, 9 and 10? We'll only look at the middle part of verse 9. Can you imagine God saying this? As he views the resistance of those who ought to love him, he says, I am broken with their whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes which go a-whoring after their idols. Can you imagine God saying that he's broken over man's resistance and rebellion? Think of this revelation. Then you have a lovely song concerning Zephaniah 3.17. On the other side, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. Can you imagine God doing this? He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Therefore, one of the headings we're going to have when we consider the living of the Christian life The greatest motive we ought to have to please God is to make God happy. And we develop this as a whole heading. What a motive. Contribute to the happiness of God. 
Do you think of any more lovely motive than that? And you know how the Lord deals with it. You remember in the parable here, Jesus gives Matthew 24 and 25. He's getting ready to leave. And you notice he has a twofold grouping here. He first of all refers to those who think they did an awful lot for the Lord. And they think they should have great reward. And they enumerate the things they should have. And the Lord has to say, you didn't do that unto me. They were serving God for reward. Then there's another group that were just serving God out of love, and they forgot all they tried to do with the Lord. And the Lord didn't. Isn't that sweet? So as we go forth to make God happy, paying no attention to remember all the little things we may have done for the Lord, just making God happy, that's all. And God remembers all these things. And so uh, they say, uh, when did we do this, Lord? When did we do this? As you have in Matthew 25, uh, 35 and on. Isn't that lovely? Then you have in the, the sixth chapter of Hebrews, God is not unrighteous to forget your labors of love. In that you have ministered to the saints and ministered to him, which you've showed toward his name. What a motive. Live our lives to make God happy. You see, before we came to Christ, we were living our lives to make ourselves happy. And in trying to do that, Jesus said, He that seeketh his life shall lose it. In other words, if you try to make yourself happy, you'll lose it. If you forget your own happiness, try to make God happy, you'll find it. That's what Jesus said. We're going to see more of this wonderful revelation. How relaxing. How blessed. What an opportunity. From some of the things we've learned to appreciate concerning God. Just think of dear Jesus here. As he went among men, knowing what was in them, we read. And they didn't want him for the most part. Think of the lament he has here in Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together? Oh, look at the tender comparison of the master. Even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wing, and ye would not. Don't you think he looked at these many earthly scenes and saw these little creatures putting their heads out with such seclusion, with such safety, consciousness? And can't you see the Lord weeping over a situation like this? And he says, this is what I would want to do to you. I don't want to take anything away from you. All I wanted to do is give you my heart, give you myself. But for some strange reason, you don't want me. Then think of the joy in heaven. Over one sin of the repentant, you wouldn't think this could be so important, would you? But the Lord says so in Luke 15, 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sin of the repentance, more than over ninety and nine just persons that need no repentance. Now we don't want to get too technical here, but God has one problem in salvation, only one, to get people 
to have a revolution of mind whereby they are willing to become intelligent. And they are willing to view their lives in relation to God. This is scripture calls repentance. God never has any trouble with saving faith, you see. We're going to see that saving faith has a divine aspect. The Spirit of God draws us into a realization of saving faith. So it would seem that God doesn't have to wait in the joys of heaven. This tells us a couple of interesting things. It says that heaven is so ready to have joy over one sinner repentance, it doesn't even have to wait another minute or two until saving faith is exercised. So here's an anxiety that there might be joy in the presence of the Lord. What a motive. Live for our great God. Because we're so important to Him. To make God happy and to avoid grief. Then God has, God possesses this indefinable power of self-determination. Or free will. We have a few instances here. Here we have the creation of man. God made this decision. Genesis 1.26 Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Here we have in Exodus 32 the tragedy of the golden calf. And what an awful thing this was. Remember, they made this image to the golden calf. Says, here's the God that brought us out of Egypt. Here's the God that separated the Red Sea. Here's the one who's taken care of us with the manna. And can't you see how grieved God was? And he says he's going to terminate this nation and start over with Moses. Here are some decisions. And then Moses makes his great intercession. He could have replaced Abraham here as the father of this nation. But rather than this, he prostrates himself in intercession. And he says here in verse 12, Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Then verse 14, And the Lord repenteth of the evil that he thought to do unto his people. Here then we have God very grievously tried, expressing his decision of judgment, changing his mind in response to Moses' intercession, and thus manifesting his ability of will. We have the passage of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 10. He expresses his free will in doing what he's doing. Verse 18, No man taketh it from me, talking about his life, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Then we have the word authority here, appearing in Acts 1, 7. And authority means decision and the ability to make decision. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power or his own authority. Then we refer to the Holy Spirit here in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. And we see that he manifests the gifts of his presence according to his own will. All these work at that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So we have this ability of will ascribed to each of the members of the Godhead. Then we have this passage in James 1, 7 concerning salvation. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
There we have many scriptures affirming that God has these abilities of personality. And he makes these decisions and ponders all that's concerned. Now we go on to item two here on page three. And we've already commented on natural attributes versus moral attributes. We have here the statement, an attribute is a description of some quality of being or character or something is true about a person or thing. And a personality, we say, is not a bundle of attributes, but has an existence concerning which it may be said that certain qualities or characteristics are always there. So by natural attributes we understand things that are true concerning the Godhead apart from their decision. These are natural existences over which God has no control. And of course the first thing we think about is the matter of eternity of existence. And the scriptures affirm this, some of which we've already looked at. We have the Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. From everlasting to everlasting, the eternity of God. We have Deuteronomy 33 and verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee. The eternal God. Then this most important passage from the New Testament on enlightenment from the natural realm, Romans 1.20, from the invisible things that are clearly seen, his eternal power and Godhead may be discovered. So we have some basis for concluding this also not merely on the basis of Scripture. We have a concept of our own limited duration, as we've seen. And we certainly perceive that the great being of God can't be limited as we are. So this gives us a basis for expecting that God would be eternal. Then we have the idea of cause and effect. This cause produced this effect which produced another cause, which produced another effect. And so we have this long chain of cause and effect. And we have to get back to an uncaused first cause as the beginning of any such chain. And here is the end of our ability to reason. And so God is declared to be this first cause. And this seems very logical to us from our own the thinking. But then do we have constancy of physical cycle, all kinds of observations of regularities that are going on. And this gives us the idea of durability or stability, which conveys the thought of an eternally stable first call who must be overseeing all these tremendous things. We have the proposition of omnipresence, which is somewhat difficult to conceive of because of our limitations. But the scripture comes along and affirms, we're now in the top of page four, affirms the fact that the God hand occupies all space. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 24. Has this to say about this matter?
Can any hide himself in the secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? So here's a declaration that God pervades all space. The psalmist affirmed this in 139, 7 to 10. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, by the way, this word hell here is the Hebrew word sheol, which is not the final destiny of the unsaved. This has the equivalent of the New Testament of Hades, and Sheol in the Old Testament, and Hades in the New, at least in the beginning part of the New Testament, was the place of departure of both the saved and the unsaved. And so here, God is sent to have his presence in the place of the departed then. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. So God is said to be everywhere present. If Paul affirmed this in Athens, as in Acts 17, he's giving this great sermon on Mars Hill. Among these many curious philosophers, he says in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And then we go on to verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they may feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So God is said to be not far from any one of us. And so God is everywhere present in a spiritual essence. But we can't perceive this with our present capacity. And so it seems to me we can only prove the existence of God by natural evidence that we see on every hand, here's this unthinkable evidence of design, and the mind must account for its existence. Here then there must be the great creator back of all this. And then we have another tremendous evidence, the present activity of God and the response of God. The response of God, both to the, those who rebel against him and those of us who submit to him. I know God exists because he's blessed us here this week. I've been blessed a lot more since I came than I was before I came. This tells us that God exists. He's moved upon us and blessed us. And so God has responded to all sorts of treatment in addition to the regularity. And then above all, in our lives, by spiritual consciousness. Notice we were use the word consciousness, not emotion. Emotion results from consciousness. Perception, recognition. We said that philosophy is trying to deny personal consciousness. But man has this consciousness. And that the most certain things that ever happen, happens in our consciousness. When a person has met the Lord and had this experience with the grace of God, it's impossible for him to get away from his consciousness. And the scripture indicates that if he's foolish enough 
to rebel against what he knows and has experienced. In the presence of God, he can't go back to the way he lived before. He'll have to pursue his sin with greediness or with determination. He cannot go back to any kind of a lackadaisical life that he had before. Because he's been made a subject of experience in his consciousness of the living presence of God. This is what we must do in trying to lead souls that they have an entry into the consciousness of God and that the Spirit of God will revolutionize their personality. And think of the positive power here. You go to Rome and see some of the great areas of persecution when thousands and thousands of Christians were put to death. And it was one of the remarkable features about this. In these great big facilities, you have not only the Colosseum, you have this great open amphitheater, seemingly several blocks long here, with this tremendous seating capacity, and each noble had his own seat, and he had to be there if he's going to maintain his position in society. And here we have the lion pen, and here we have the saints of God, listening to the roar of these creatures. Singing praises to God, saying, Brother and sister, these are our friends. They'll come and introduce us into the precious Savior's presence. Let's have no antagonism sent toward anybody. And here they sang and praised their way. And here they went to their earthly doom with worship and with thanksgiving. Do you think they did this based on a theological deduction? This has to be based on a living, conscious experience of the living God. And why do you suppose that as these thousands of people Watch this situation, they said. If any human being can get to the point of experiencing something so dynamic and so profound, there must be something to it. And so the old Roman Empire came to say, we better quit this awful persecution while we still have a chance to continue existing. Because the more Christians we're putting to death, the more are becoming Christians. Why? Because God leads us into a consciousness, which is the most positive thing that ever exists. You can't describe it. You can't describe the new birth. It's a miracle. You know when you have it. You know something has happened. And here's the great proof of the existence of God. Not by our direct understanding, but by the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our consciousness. You can read more about this at the end of section 10. How thankful we are for this. And so you have a change. You don't need to think that Constantine and these vicious Roman rulers suddenly had an emotion for Christianity. They saw that there was a disintegration going on. This is why they increased their persecution around 300, thinking they could step this thing out by intensity. And they found out they were losing ground, not gaining it. And the reason they're losing ground is because people are getting into a conscious, living relation with God. 
And the power of God is coming down in their life and giving them the deepest possible conceivable assurance of the being and love of God. And nothing can deter them. Now God's presence is particularly manifested in a distinct place called heaven. We have this referred to in both the Old and the New Testament. So heaven is not a vague, imaginative thing. It's a distinct place somewhere in the universe. You have the many Old Testament passages, one of which would be 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold the heaven, and the heaven of the heaven cannot contain thee. How much left this house that I have built it? A distinct reference to a place of rulership a center of God's manifestation. You have Psalm 103, 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heaven, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Then you have the words of our precious Lord. He says, I am going to prepare a place, a distinct locality, of course. John 14, 2 and 3, in my Father's house are in many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now Stephen was given to see a vision of this place, as we see in the seventh chapter of Acts. And so in his dying moment, something happened. There was an open vision given him to this wonderful place of heaven. And there he was given to see the Lord Jesus. Revelation has many references to this distinct place. We have Revelation 4, 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So we see, although we can't understand some of these great things, we have this deep inner assurance. An interesting passage occurs in 2 Corinthians 4. And verse 18. And here we have it affirmed what condition we're in now. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen by our present facility. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here are the things which are seen, the things which are not seen. Now look at all the things we don't know. And how we form our daily activity over uncounted things that we don't understand. Now take this mystery of wave motion. All kinds of theories exist concerning radio and television waves. If we haven't lived through the origination of this, you can't quite get the excitement that originally existed. The beginning of the radio era, most people got involved in building their own sets. First of all, because the price of an assembled set was exceedingly high. And then because there was a tremendous interest. So I remember investing some of my boy's money, some of his equipment, and finally working at it and getting it all started up and hooked up. 
And we didn't think of a loudspeaker then, of course. If we could hear it on earphones, we thought this was tremendous. And what an excitement when the thing actually hooked up and actually worked. And we look around the room. Where are these radio boys? I didn't know they were here. I had no perception whatever that they're here. They don't bother me. Have you ever heard anybody say what it is? And how to explain the existence of radio waves around the world? And if we had an instrument here, we could pick up several thousand radio waves right in this room. Anyone ever explain just what it was? I know there's all kinds of theories, but what is it? Did you ever hear explain what electricity is? And how this can go through a wire? Oh, yes. An ending study on the application of these tremendous things, but what is it? How do you prove that it exists? You prove that it exists by the results, don't you? Not by your understanding. How do you know there's a wind when it blows? Have any perception of it? Have any understanding of it? You're persuaded of this when you have the reactions to it. How do you understand the travel of noise and explosion? Why is it that you can have, that you can create an explosion? And how do you perceive that it actually has been done? only by observing the results. And so we're confronted on every hand of all sorts of things that we assume in our daily life apart from understanding. And so indeed it shouldn't be surprising if we can't presently understand exactly the nature of God's spiritual being and how He can be present. And we have to understand this, as I said, finally, by his manifestation to us. And when this happens, it's the most positive thing that ever could be. Look at it this way. Every single observation of my five senses has to pass into the mind for interpretation. This is a secondary approach, isn't it? But God comes right directly into my being. And I don't have to interpret His presence. I experience it directly. And this is why this is the most positive evidence that ever can take place. This is the sacred thing called the new birth. Born from above, passed from death on the life. And how can we ever think that the Holy Spirit can invade us without overwhelmingly giving us this consciousness? But as we said before, under the spiritual nature of God, we're going to receive facilities someday, as Paul said. And the things which are not seen now will then be seen in direct perception. And no longer will we have to walk by faith.